We're going to get sort of jump right in, and I was kind of hoping we would start at the present and work our ways backward. So um, one of the, with the recent involvement of Russia now in a much more direct fashion in Syria over the last week or two, we've entered, it would seem, almost a, a new phase. And the whole notion of this being a proxy war, if that was ever at doubt, is now much less so. So being historians, we generally don't like to be told to look into the future with our crystal balls. But where do you, where do you see this going in the next, the next couple of months, next year? Well, it's quite clear that Russia has gone all in here, and Putin is putting his money behind the Assad regime and trying to help it expand its borders from just this coastal right. you know, rump state that it had turned into, owning Damascus, Homs Hama, only half of Aleppo, the four major cities that separate the desert from the zone and the coastal region. And um, they're going to take back Aleppo. And I think that's the big you know, sort of goal here. Friends of mine in Damascus have said, we're going to take back Aleppo. You watch, you know, that kind of bra braggadocia that is coming along with this. And Russia seems to be in it. Uh, I think they want to you know, make some inroads against ISIS in Palmyra, but really it's about shoring up the Assad state, which is Russia's foothold in the Middle East. So conventional wisdom has it that in some ways that Assad has been on the back foot over the last year, that the military sort of holding power that he had previously has been, um, has been slipping away, that ISIS has made inroads, in some cases even the rebels. Not that there's any real sense that we've moving beyond the detente, but this really could be shifting things. And if there is a concerted sort of Russia, Iran, Assad collaboration in a much more sort of effective on the ground sense, this could change the dynamic. It, it is going to change the dynamic. I think you're right. And, and the West, with its coalition of Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar, the Gulf states in right. general, had the philosophy was if we give more arms and more training to the Sunni rebels, we can push back this Alawite rump state to right. be so weak, teetering on collapse, they'll, they'll make deep compromise and they'll give away, they'll kick out the Assad somehow. Right. and. Uh, and you'll get a political process that'll lead towards democracy. That's the American right, thing. Right, right, right. Or, you know, a Sunni takeover would be the Saudi thing. Right. Now, and then you would have a political process. This, of course, turns it around to where a Russian point of view is, if Assad pounds these Sunni rebels, they will have to come to the peace table and make deep compromises. Right. And um, we don't know yet whether Russia and Assad are thinking they can reconquer the whole country mm. or whether they're going to do this big push and then try to get some kind of international understanding on perhaps a de facto partition that they won't call a partition, they'll call it a federal state or something like that, where Assad would be remaining in power. Right. And that Alawite security state, which is the heart of the state that the rebels want to overthrow, remains somehow. And, and that's what we don't know. Right. So let's go back a ways, uh, because much of the commentary that's coming out right now is really focusing on these contemporary dynamics and looking ahead a little bit. But what I think is much less understood is how Assad came into power in the first place, and that is to say the, the transition between his father, Hafez Assad, to Bashar al-Assad, and what it is about the nature of this state that makes it, say, different from Tunisia or Egypt. Why did Assad not fall? If we had our non uh, regal dictators in the Middle East falling one after one, as it would have seemed at that time back in those heady days of uh, the spring of 2011 when we watched uh, first um, you know, Egypt, Tunisia, and then later Yemen. What was it about the particular dynamic of the power base creation on Assad's part, or the Assad's part, which led Syria to be a much more stable dictatorship? It's really the colonial occupation in this Levant. First of all, the Levant is a multi-religious, multi-ethnic world, unlike okay. North Africa okay. or the Gulf. The Gulf is a little bit, but it's Sunni Arab. In Syria, you get a much, you know, it's Noah's Ark. There's two of everything. Of course, the Sunni Arabs are 70% of the population. Kurds, 10. Religious minorities, 20. Alawites are 12. They're the ones we're really interested in. And then there's other heterodox Shiites, coming up to 15, Druze and Ismailis, and then 5% Christian. Everybody says 10%. They were 14% after World War II, but they've really collapsed to five now. But that's 20% religious minorities, 10% Kurds, 70% Sunni Arab. How did those, that minority, the Alawites, get to rule this big country for so long? 
It seems strange, but it isn't if you look at the Levant, because every single state in the Levant was ruled by a minority after World War II. Why? Because the colonial powers, Britain and France, that divided up these Ottoman lands after World War I, gave a leg up to the minorities, divide and rule, right. um, during the interwar years. When they left, you had Maronite Christians having a lion's share of power in Lebanon, national pact, right? right. Because there, in Lebanon, the president had to be a Maronite Catholic, mm -hmm. the head of the army had to be a Maronite Catholic, and Christians in general got six out of 11 seats in parliament. So that was a distribution. So they would be, have the lion's share of parliament and everything else. In Syria, it was Alawites who came to power because they joined the army under the French in disproportionate numbers. So did Armenians and Druze and all the other minorities. But the Alawites were the biggest minority. They fought their way to the top in a very um, unstable period because the French leave in 46, you get the first three coups in 49, then you get a series, you know, 20 or something coups, coups and failed coups leading up to 1970 when Assad, Hafez al-Assad, the father, takes power, consolidates around one family, and they remain. Right. But you get these Alawites at the core of the security state. In, in Iraq, it's the Sunnis, who are 20% of the population as opposed to 60 Shiite, 20 Kurd. And in Israel, you can even shove the Israeli-Palestinian conflict into this, because Palestine, Jews are about 5% in 1850. By the First World War, they're 14. By 1948, when the British leave, they're a third. Immediately, war breaks out in 48. The Palestinians think two-thirds of the population they're going to be able to dominate, but of course they get beaten terribly in the 48 war. Two-thirds are driven out of the country, never to be able to return. And the Jews ingather. They've been sorted out in Central Europe. They've been sorted out in the Arab world. <laughs> And they all collect in Palestine. So they're the only minority from this big area that's able to turn themselves into a majority, right. get rid of the majority population. And so this is the great sorting out that I've been talking about. And so all those Levantine states, which are minority ruled, mm -hmm. we've been seeing civil war and this great sorting out, which is very long and bloody. And, uh, and now it's the turn of you know, of Syria. I'm really interested in this because from what I understand from your, your argument is this idea that what the Levant is currently going through is analogous to what happened to Eastern Europe in World War II and that we have going to see a rearrangement of population uh, along a sort of a uniform fashion that will bring identity in line with nation states so that as, for example, happened with the Poles in World War II, that, that, that we can also see happening in, in, in the Levant. But this is, the difference here is that instead of a type of linguistic identity politics or perhaps uh, right. ethnic, ethnic identity politics, you're talking about a religious identity politics where religion is first and foremost the prime identifying marker. marker. Yes. Um, and that? That's true, you know, because of course, you know, the Maronite saw themselves as the Phoenician, they tried to differentiate the Jews, differentiate themselves ethnically, even right. though, you know, what's the difference between a Middle Eastern Jew, a Damascene Jew, and a Damascene Muslim, right? There's, there's, they both eat tabbouleh, they speak Arabic, they do the debki, you know. They look Arab, right? but they've defined themselves as two different nations. And when I or, confront- Or circumstances to, or force them to define themselves that way in certain cases, right? Yes, it's yes. very contingent. There is a great deal of contingency to this identity. A lot of people accuse me of saying, or they criticize me, let me just say that of being uh, primordial right. identities. Right. But it's right. not primordial. Right. This is nationalism. Nationalism is new. You know, in, in a sense, there's nothing more modern than nationalism. And oh, absolutely, yeah. In, in, the a... world of, in the world of international relations, you would have to say that the marker for modernity is the rise of the nation state. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's what happened to Europe in the 19th century. And that's why it had all these internal civil wars that were fought in Europe that gave rise to these nation states. And with the parallel would be the, the fall and dissolution of the Austro-Hungarian Empire versus the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, which then gave rise to these smaller nation states. And, and uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's I a agree long, with It's that. a bloody process. Yeah. And, and you know, the world has been transformed. We've got 193 nation states today. But you go back 250 years, there was not a nation state in the world. 
you had bishoprics and free cities and emirates and caliphates and you know kingdoms and tribes. You had every kind of political con right. con nation, very diverse, but no nation states. Well, what, what I guess what I'm interested in, in, in sort of to, to test this out a little bit, because I can understand why people would be perhaps uncomfortable with the understanding that nation states were going to have to follow along right. religious lines. I mean, and this does seem to posit some kind of longer essence and whatnot. But if, for example, in uh, Western Europe, where I grew up, and Switzerland's an interesting example for this, the case study here, is that here we have a country where there are four national languages. Uh, people identify themselves along to generally two religious lines, Protestant, Catholic. There was a civil war in the mid-19th century where the Protestants won and forced the Catholics into a centralized country. Um, but the country continues, continues to exist, and it exists right. in, a, in a diverse fashion. One could say something quite similar about Spain. Arguably, one could say, after the Scots decided not to leave Great Britain, that even Great Britain itself would be here as a linguistically diverse nation state with a multiplicity of languages and even uh, religions which, which exist within it. Um, why do you think that, the, because it sounds from what you say like the great sorting out is almost an inevitable process which is happening in parallel to past historical processes of the same kind only along religious mm -hmm. lines. And I wonder here if that's, that necessarily has to follow or couldn't we tell a story that foresees perhaps a happier ending. A happier ending. Or is it just that I'm, I'm suffering from wishful thinking and that you're the car, sort of cold-eyed realist who's looking and seeing what actually is going to happen? Well, I think there's a very bloody side to national building, whether it's in Western Europe or Eastern Europe. But I think you're picking at something that does, you know, a difference between Eastern Europe right. and Western Europe that's okay. very real. And the, the way I would describe it, it try to point it out, is let's say we take nation building in Western, nationalism in Western Europe as patriotism. And we call nationalism in Eastern Europe nationalism. Why? Because you have the rise of, nation, of, of centralized absolutist monarchs in the West that create states that have borders. And they arise before the rise of nationalism. You've got a French monarchy, a Spanish yes, monarchy, yes. British monarchy. Mm -hmm. And they're territorially based. And so when they enter into the world of nationalism and the national age, they're going to turn Frenchmen into, fr into Frenchmen. They're not going to ethnically cleanse. So it's not until, you know, according to Eugene Weber, it's not until 1860 that right. most French people speak French. Right. You've got Languedoc and you've got, you know, Normand and Britannia and you've mm -hmm. got Italian spoken over here and right. Alsace, like German. So nobody's understanding each other. There's a bunch of these weirdos all together. But the French national system through that, you know, that rigorous school system where everybody takes the same dictation on the same day, you get a Frenchman. In the East, where the state is not built before the nation, you get nationalism posited first, and then they have to build a state. So nationalism in Germany, in right, Italy, right. in Slavic countries, yes. is posited first, and it's a racial, ethnic determination of the nation. So you want Germans all in one state, and Hitler goes about killing the Jews, wiping out the Slavs, turning them into the Germans, the Aryans, are the superman. And you're gonna attack Poland and Czechoslovakia and try to bring them into one. And in response to that, the Slavs, the Poles, you know, in from 1945 to 47 in Central Europe, 13 million Germans are ethnically cleansed from Poland. The Sedenten Germans, 3 million, all gone from Czechoslovakia. The Hungarian Germans, even a little sliver of land like Crimea, right. which has been so much in the news lately. 5% of Crimeans were German. Hitler occupied them, used them as a collaborative elite. Right. And then when Stalin retook it at the end of the war, Boom, all those five million, those five percent were marched either to Siberia, where they died on the way, or they fled. Now the argument, I mean, you, there's a coherence to what you're saying, and that makes it powerful, but you're also collapsing the mid-20th century into the late 19th century, right? I mean, Germany... Well, there's, a, there's, a, there's a root to what happens right. in, the, okay. in the Second World War, because okay. you, you get this, you know, the class of 1919 is what, you know, it's my conceit for bringing the Ottoman Empire together with Austro-Hungarian. Okay. And First World War is a great empire-destroying war. Russian, German, Austro-Hungarian, Ottoman Empire, all destroyed, multi-ethnic, multi-religious. They don't fit into neat packages. Right. The borders are drawn somewhat haphazardly with all these minorities inside each one. Right. And they stay there until World War II when this great sorting out happens. And the borders don't so much change. It's the people that are changed. So you get the Jews are killed, the Ruthenians pushed out of Poland, to, and, and then the Germans are 
13 million Germans are ethnically cleansed at the end of the war, but, and even the Czechs and Slovaks can't live together, right? E in 1990, they have to separate. They do it peaceably, which is nice, in contrast to the Yugoslavs. So what's, what's this, this is all incredibly depressing, because if I'm following you down, the logical conclusion is that a kind of a, a multi-ethnic cosmopolitan society is not really feasible. It's feasible after you define who you are. And, and that's, you know, what we are seeing in a sense. So you really can't give minorities power, that is to say, in many ways. Because this is a great colonial strategy. You would always want to give the minority power because they're, they're dependent upon you because they can't rely on somebody else. So they're always That's giving the power. That's the Levantine story. Yeah, and that works really well if you're a colonial power. But it, yes, along that, that logic, it bodes very poorly. For well, you. Africa and MENA, the Middle East, and some places in Asia look bad. I mean, a hundred nation states got their independence between 1945 and 1973. hundred out of a 193. Right. And, you know, in American academe, people like to say, oh, we're living in a post-colonial age, and they look to the EU. And it's, you know, uh, it's true if you're sitting... Neo-colonial might be another If you're sitting in Belgium, yes. right? Yeah. It looks like that, because you're looking at EU, you're looking at the economic union, you're looking at NATO, you're looking at these multinational, transnational right. things. But if you're sitting out in the peripheries, and it's not really peripheries, most of the world, right. it doesn't look post-national. It looks like the nation is just forming itself. You know, Southern Sudan breaks off, the Palestinians will it be a state, the Kurds are emerging. These, you know, you, well, Ukraine, the Russians versus the Ukrainians, Crimea, it's all a mess. And the borders aren't defined. Who is the real population? Who are the fifth columns? Can you work together? Well, the political community. And we're seeing that in Europe right now too, with the with the refugee influx, for example. People, and this has been going on for I think since the end of the Cold War, as we've seen a, a great uh, initial sort of optimism about globalization, about the possibility of global communities, the increased irrelevance of the nation state. But then at the moment, we have a huge amount of anxiety on the part of, uh, on the one hand, white Americans. But look what the Germans look at Mama Merkel. Is right. doing. I mean, in a sense, the Germany, the most racist state of the Second World War, right, right has transformed itself into mm -hmm. the acceptor of the other and giving nationalism, which used to be only if you were a German. You know, two million Germans from the East Bloc after 1990 mm -hmm. who hadn't been members of the German nation for four generations sometimes, you right. know, sort of right. Igor Schmidt from Kazakhstan. Who, who didn't speak a word of German could go back and get German nationality after four generations right. of Germany because of the ethnic nature of that nationalism. Right. And Germany's come a long way. So we're thinking at the moment, we come back to the present, it's hard not to. Now, the, the rise of ISIS in part has to do with what you were talking about, the disfranchised nature of the Sunni majority falling, the, you know, the nation right. state falls apart, they see a chance to establish a new form of a political social contract that will not have them always being underneath. The, it, we had in the case in Iraq, uh, we had, um, you know, the Shia, Shia minority reestablish it, uh, majority establish itself, uh, reestablish itself. But ISIS is very recent. Yes. The, the reason that, that it is in the state it is has a lot to do with the fact that the United States decided to dissolve the Iraqi National Army when it, when it, under Bremer during that time period, essentially already signaling to uh, the Sunni minority that they were in danger of being socially isolated and that there would be no attempt to reestablish any kind of national contract. Um, this makes a good recipe for a uh, extremely violent apocalyptic movement, but a nation state, a long-term nation state, it does not make, which no. means that we don't, I come back to the problem that we simply don't have an alternative at the moment. That is to say, there is nobody waiting in the wings. Now that the Syrian opposition has entirely fallen apart, American attempts have been laughable at establishing any kind of coherent... Uh, a moderate, because you, you see, the Americans will not deal with the Muslim Brotherhood. Right. A and that's at the heart of the problem here, because when the Americans and, and, and Secretary of State Clinton first tried to get together a Syrian National Council that could be a government in exile, in exile and right. uh, in the wings and transfer the authority, because that's, right, 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 that's right, a right. Libyan model. They'd created this Libyan right. National Council and then they transferred, the UN transferred sovereignty from Qaddafi's state to this new state that they created. And right. then they transferred all the money abroad that they froze they took it away from Qaddafi over $100 billion, and they moved it to this new state. So they right. didn't have to spend the money. This new state had all the money that right. Qaddafi right. had been storing in Italy and every place. Right. So they could just do the switcheroo and fund what they thought would be a successful revolution. 
by doing the switcheroo. So they were trying to do the same thing in Syria, set up this alternative. The trouble is, every time there was an election in the SNC, the Muslim Brotherhood won. Right. And America would say, oh, well, it's not really representative, and there's not enough Kurds, and why don't you do this, and we gotta have it, and they would never shift sovereignty and right. never recognize it because right. they didn't want a bunch of Muslims ruling, I mean, Islamists ruling. And they had their mind that some secular Harvard-educated guys would... Yeah, we don't actually, the which is it's difficult to follow because we've, they tried that with Iraq as well. I mean, whatever. It but you know, look, at America cannot recognize the Muslim Brother. How are you gonna get a Muslim Brotherhood guy and have a president of America take him to the Congress and say, this is our man? You can't do it. Well, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but the entirely ironic considering, for example, the extraordinary religious nature of the United States of America and the, and the large role that religion plays in, in the United States politics. But we politics. have separation of church and state. I mean, we're in a sense of post-enlightenment. Uh, now, here's nominal, another thing that's gonna piss you off. Nominally, but, but we are a post-enlightenment state. You know, our founding fathers, oh. George Washington and all oh. the rest of them, they separated church and state. Not, and they, con not constitutionally, but yes, you're right, in their writings. Well, okay, but I mean, we teach in the American system that diversity is good. Okay, well, and, uh, and, and that's not the situation in the, a nation I, I, I can like see Syria. here is where, where critics might want to come at you with your, with the, accusing okay. you of essentializing. Come at me. Come, come, well, uh, accusing you of essentializing, yeah. because essentially what you've just said is that a document and discussions had in the late 18th century in the United States of America lead to the direct possibilities that exist today. And of course, that was a document that took a long time in understanding. So initially, it was indeed, in fact, that all white landowning men over 25 were equal. But if you were a woman, if you were not white, and if you didn't own land, you were not given an equal participant. And so it's been an ongoing process, one that's one arguably unfulfilled till today to march towards Those to principles equality. Those were enshrined, even right. though the people were right. backwards, no, look, and they didn't I, accept I, women I, and slaves. I, and they I, could fight for it right. because the principles right. were enshrined of equality. Yes. The right. principles of equality, this is where, because there were principles of inequality mm. that are, were sort of latent in the religious interpretation of who was going to heaven. No, right. okay, no, that-, that In I, Syria. I, I'm gonna come at you on that. And one. ISIS, ISIS comes up, and ISIS is following the ninth grade textbook in Syria that was taught. Nobody acted on the ninth grade textbook, right. but boom, the ninth grade textbook says, how do you deal with pagans and atheists. And it says there's only two ways, convert them or kill them. Right. So but when ISIS takes over the Yazidis, mm -hmm. they've got a problem on their hands. You've got a pre-Islamic religion society here. Right. You convert them or you kill them. That's what they did, that's what they said. And, right. and, and the Yazidis fled, right? Or they were captured and the women were taken into slavery and but booty a, and so forth. But there's a difference here from saying, for example, that diversity is not recognized and acknowledged as an organizational political principle and the Levant because of some kind of inherent scriptural misreading or reading, and saying that the political order that we currently have in the Levant and the Middle East is the direct outgrow of a series of colonial and post-colonial interventions it's which, both. Ha which have destabilized the region and made certain interpretations of religion more palatable for people trying to call, carve out their own political fiefdoms. I mean, I don't, it doesn't have to be a Marxist to go back right. to the fact of saying that there is a material inequality which is at the core of these and that the religious sectarian ideology that's slapped down on top of that is merely a way of ideologically gathering people around an objective which is inherently a political material one. Right. You're right. I mean, right? I, and I, I that can be, people can misunderstand, especially in the United States where, where when yeah. looking from afar, they're like, oh, those Sunnis and Shia have been at each other's throats for 1300 years. It's kind of like the Arab-Israeli Congress, like, oh, the Muslims and Jews have been fighting. And that ignores the entire contingent right. political series of events that led us to where we are. You're right. I mean, what I'm presenting to you in this great sorting out paradigm right. is a very narrow cultural identity nationalism point of view. Okay. There is a story on the socioeconomic side. Right. There's a story on right. uh, foreign involvement. There's a story on Ba'athism and you know, political movements in the Middle East, all of which need to be told alongside this story. And of course, you know, who becomes Alawite in the 11th and 12th century? It's probably their socioeconomic factors. There's cultural factors and you know, who are the, who's taking over Syria? Where do these people come from? How, why do they, why are these sectarian differences there to begin with? The trouble is the different religious establishments institutionalize these differences so that you get trapped into being an Alawite because you're an Alawite. You right. can't intermarry, right. you don't get to get these economic advantages, and then you get stuck, as you say, in the downer, you know, in, 
discriminated against and being poor. You know, there's dialectical differences, right. there's cultural differences, there's food differences, right. there's musical differences. Right. These all begin to take on a, um, and unfortunately we're seeing them take on, well, they could have moved in a different direction. If but the you, economy had grown, you know, if it had been China in Syria right. and there had been 10 or 12% growth every year, right. 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 the Alawites may have been able to break out and integrate happily and the countryside wouldn't have risen up against the city because they wouldn't have been poor and, and, and discriminated against in the way that they were. Well, let me ask you this. I, some would argue, and these people would probably see themselves more on the progressive left, that the reason we have such an, an, a, a sectarian issue at the current point in the Middle East is because of unresolved unre issues that emerged out in the post-colonial era from ways in which the colonial powers structured the regional political scene in order to better exploit, take advantage of these actors, and once they withdrew, they left a huge mess behind them. Right. Now, to some extent, what that does is it takes away agency from the local actors who then merely right. become the pawns of these. Any, any colonial the powers were only here for 20 years. I mean, you've got to remember, the French arrive in 1919 and they, they leave in 1946. And right. it's a short period. You know, it's 25 years, 26 years. Right. They were working. They had to, ex they, were, they were just freewheeling it. And when they had a Sunni uprising against them, what do they do? They get the minorities into the right, army right, because right. the minorities are willing to shoot at the Sunnis right. already. Those deep differences were there to be exploited. Now the French had exploited them, but the Ottomans had exploited them before them. So did the Egyptians. Right. You know, when they occupied Muhammad Ali and so forth, he went and got the Christians and so forth and the Druze, and he used them against the Sunnis who were working with the Ottomans. I mean, everybody has done it. And because it's fertile ground to be politically instrumentalized. Yes, yes. And and that goes back and forth. But there are these ideological differences. Why could ISIS dip into this grab bag of Islam and pull out, oh, we get to kill the Yazidis? Because, well, some would argue because that they had an entire country next door that had similar interpretations of the text in Saudi Arabia. Yes, I mean, they, they, they have that, but they're also fighting against Nusaitis. They're fighting against these right. traditional right. 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 enemies. So they can frame it in terms of early Islamic history. Right. Of, it's and, perfect. Right. Yeah. And they can justify it according to the Quran. And they can mobilize. Look at how much assistance. You know, 30,000 foreign fighters. Yeah. You can't get those good fighters. The, all the money that flowed in from the Gulf and so forth, you can't do that unless you can frame it in those religious terms that has resonance throughout a much broader Islamic world. And they're winning, or they've done as well as they've done, right. precisely because they hit those chords that resonated throughout this much broader world and brought them attention, money, recruits, weapons, power. Okay, well, well now I'm thoroughly depressed, but I think that that's unfortunately a good place to leave it. So thank you, thank you very much, Joshua. That's well, it's a that pleasure. Was, that was a real pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.